Hello and welcome to the Respond webinar. Throughout this session, all participants will be in listen-only mode, and afterwards there will be a question and answer session. Just to remind you, this session is being recorded. I'll now hand you over to Andrew Howard. Please begin. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first webinar of our latest low carbon project, Respond. My name, as you've been told, is Andy Howard, and I'm the project manager for this project. Uh, thank you all for registering to take part. Um, we expect our audience is about 40 people, and it's a broad mix of industry participants representing network operators, energy suppliers, equipment suppliers, energy industry partnerships, and then consumers. We hope that there's something in everyone for everyone in this webinar today. If we have a quick look at the agenda, firstly, we're going to provide some background on the RESPOND project, then provide an overview of our progress to date and our next steps. At the end of the session, there will be an opportunity for you to put questions to me and other members of the RESPOND team. Format for the webinar is a presentation is presentation by myself, which will take 25 to 30 minutes, followed by the question and answer session of around 10 minutes. Uh, you can submit questions online during the webinar using the box on screen, or you can take part in the live Q&A. You will need to dial in using your telephone and pressing 01 on the keypad to let us know you have a question. As well as feedback on the project itself, we're also interested to hear your comments on the webinar technology that we're using. Uh, so you'd be, we would be grateful if you complete a short survey at the end of the webinar by clicking on the survey button at the bottom of your screen after the Q&A session. So let's have a quick look at ENW's overall innovation strategy. Historically, we've adopted a fit and forget approach to maintaining the electricity network. We predict and design to allow for the worst case scenarios and use standard building blocks. Now, while this leads to efficiencies in scale and simplicity in operation, it can lead to small changes in requirements by our customers becoming large network changes, which in turn leads to secure but underutilized assets. Two of the key elements of our innovation strategy are to engage with our customers to help develop alternative approaches, which maximize the use of our existing assets and minimize the use of new. At Electricity Northwest, we, are lead, well, we believe we are leading the way in developing smart solutions to meet the UK's future energy challenges. This means accelerating change where demand and generation will grow, placing stress on our network both in normal operation and during fault situations. Our previous projects have looked at how we manage the network during normal operation. This, our latest project, Respond, looks at alternative ways of managing our network after the unexpected by delivering an intelligent approach to managing fault level. So, a quick summary of what we mean by fault level. Our network is designed to handle normal current 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and is protected by circuit breakers and other devices at key locations. When a fault occurs on the network, fault current surges towards the point of fault from all the sources of generation. This fault current is much greater than normal current and places stress on all the equipment that it flows through. The protective devices all see this fault current and react quickly, so the fault's disconnected. The amount of fault current that flows for any fault will vary depending on the type of fault that the system has experienced, the location of it, and how the network configured at any moment in time, plus the amount of generation that's connected. If unchecked, fault current can damage equipment in a matter of seconds. The fault level is the maximum we expect this fault current to be. Now, we know from operating the network that the maximum fault current changes during the day, 
as we change the configuration of our network and as sources of generation are switched on and off. However, using our historic design modeling tools, we only predict what the worst case fault level will be to ensure that our network operates safely at all times under all circumstances, taking into account the maximum rating at which our equipment can safely perform. Now, when we decide that the potential fault current is larger than the rating of any of the equipment, our traditional approach is to replace that equipment with a higher rated equivalent. This reinforcement is expensive, can be time consuming and disruptive for customers. This approach also doesn't provide an accurate way of measuring fault current. So how can we work smarter, predict fault current more accurately and avoid resorting to expensive reinforcement? Our current network management system allows us to safely control and operate across the different voltages of our network. But currently it does not have the capacity to perform network studies, which are done using different offline tools. Respond will enhance the functionality and data within our new network management system to include that element of work, the ability to study and assess fault levels. This additional functionality is known as the fault level assessment tool and it will hold all the ratings information of our equipment and will calculate fault levels in near real time. When fault level approaches or rises above the fault level rating of network equipment, the fault level tool will notice this and will be able to enable one of three innovative techniques designed to manage fault current. The techniques are adaptive protection, the fault current limiting service, and the IS limiter. All three techniques, when enabled, respond after a fault occurs, reducing fault current so that every item of network equipment operates safely. The first technique we're going to cover is adaptive protection, also known as sequential tripping. As I mentioned, our network is already designed to break fault current and isolate the fault section of the network using circuit breakers and other protective devices. Adaptive, pro adaptive protection changes the order that the circuit breakers operate to safely disconnect the fault from the rest of the network. And by using the redundancy built into the network, we can ensure that using this approach, no other customers will go off supply as part of the change. Next, we'll cover the IS limiter. The IS limiter is a current limiting fuse. Now, our standard equipment will normally identify a fault and respond to it within a couple of hundred milliseconds. This might seem fast, but the fault current will have already peaked within this short time frame. An IS limiter, however, will operate within five milliseconds or one two hundredth of a second before the fault current reaches its peak. When enabled by the fault level assessment tool, the limiter will monitor the normal current flowing through it. When a fault occurs, the limiter detects the rapid rise in current and responds by setting off a small explosive charge, which breaks or diverts the normal flow of a current to a fuse to where it is, it is extinguished. Um, IS limiters are in use on private networks in the UK and public networks worldwide. However, they're not currently used on UK public networks. As part of the project, as well as proving the effectiveness of the technology, Respond will review the safety case and the use of these devices for UK networks. As part of the project, we will effectively replace an existing circuit breaker with an IS limiter at two locations on our network. The third technique we're going to trial is the fault current limiting service. Now, fault current can be generated from a number of sources, including customer's equipment running in synchronization with our network. The largest of these rotating plants are either designed to generate electricity or can be large synchronous noises that usually consume electricity but can flip into becoming a generator when the supply voltage drops. 
These rotating machines can supply up to eight times their load current at the time of fault as a fault current. The fault current limiting service enables us to disconnect the fault current generated by industrial, commercial and generation customers using new technology which will be trialled under Respond. This commercial solution will enable customers to earn rewards and will benefit all distribution customers through reduced reinforcement costs. We believe there is a significant equipment out there connected to our network that is contributing to fault current that could be part of the solution. Our challenge as part of the project is to identify those customers who have such equipment, who are willing to be engaged with to, for us to explain, respond, and to see if they are willing and able to contribute to the project. We foresee a fault current limiting service could work like this. <clears throat> this is a very simplified diagram of an electricity network in which electricity generally flows through the two transformers at the top of the slide to the factory on the left and the homes and businesses on the right. At the factory, there are different types of equipment connected, including a large motor and a large generator at the bottom of the page. Now, fault occurs on a network, and the fault current rushes towards the point of fault. All our protected devices see the fault current, but the closest one to the fault operates first and disconnects the customers on the network beyond the fault. Now, if the total current is less than the rating of the equipment, everything operates normally and safely. However, if the sum of all the currents running through that breaker is higher than its rating, then the equipment could be damaged and the fault could spread. So on the example where the fault current is higher than the equipment rating, how can we reduce it to a lower safe level before that breaker operates so that we don't need to upgrade any of the equipment. One way of reducing the current is to disconnect the customer's motor and or generator. Now this we would plan to happen instantly using the new technology deployed as part of Respond. Once the fault section has been isolated and the motor and generator can be switched back on, during this session, the rest of the customer's equipment would remain on as normal. Only the selected items of plant would be interrupted, and only until we have disconnected the fault, put our system back to normal, which would normally be up to about five minutes. As part of the RESPOND project, we are trying to find out do customers have equipment that can contribute to the fault level? How big their equipment is? Where is it? We're also trying to find out, are customers willing for this equipment to be disconnected if and when required? We don't expect customers to do this for free, so we're also trying to understand what commercial and technical arrangements need to be put into place to facilitate this. Ultimately, the project will identify the long-term benefits of a fault current limiting service to customers across the whole of Great Britain. So, how will we establish if and at what price customers are willing to offer for a fault current limiting service? Well, we're going to carry out a customer survey with industrial and commercial demand and generation customers. The survey is going to be led by our project partner, Impact Research. An engaged customer panel will be set up to help us structure the survey so that it's easy for customers to understand and it's appropriate for that target audience. We will work with our other project partners, the ADE and Energy, to recruit customers from across the UK to take part in the panel and the survey. The learning from the survey will be used to develop a draft commercial contract for a fault current limiting service that we will trial as part of the RESPOND project. During the trial, we will be monitoring our network performance and those customers' experience through the trials. 
We are still looking for customers to take part in the survey. So if you would like to take part, please register your interest at the website address. So the hypothesis that we intended to prove during the project are that respond. One, is faster and cheaper to apply than traditional reinforcement. It will deliver a by order of fault level mitigation solutions based on a cost benefit analysis. It will facilitate active management of fault current using retrofit technologies and commercial services. It will enable a market for the provision of fault current limiting services. It will use existing assets with no detriment to the health. And it will reduce bills for customers by reducing our network reinforcement costs. So, quick summary of the RESPOND project. It's a five and a half million pound project which started in January and will run until October 2018. We plan to install the fault level assessment tool and deliver these innovating techniques at the number of sites shown on the slide. The RESPOND method is expected to release the same capacity as traditional reinforcement, but up to 18 times faster and at a much lower cost, potentially up to 80% cheaper, saving Great Britain up to £2.3 billion by 2050. Now, let's have a quick look at our progress to date. Our customer engagement plan and our data privacy statements are now all in place. Our project website is up and running and will be kept up to date as the project develops. And I do recommend visiting the website as there's lots of, lots of information about the project held there. We are also publicizing the project through our partners, the ADE and Energy, through the IET and through other media outlets and company publications such as ABB and Schneider Electric. We are receiving customer interest for our engaged customer panel and survey requirements, but we are still keen to hear from a large and wide varied customer base or their representatives to ensure that the survey and subsequent contracts best represent everyone's views. We have also placed orders for the major project items and are now confirming our detailed installation plans. We have also confirmed all the sites we are planning to work on for the RESPOND project. In terms of next steps, over the next few months, we will be focusing on the following key activities. We will be convening our first customer expert panel and starting our work carrying out customer surveys. We will carry on installing the fault level assessment tool, the ice limiters and the adaptive protections on site and we will continue to keep you informed of our progress through webinars, mail shots, and through our website. Hopefully what I've spoken about this morning has been some interest to you, but now it's time for questions and answers. So the first question is, uh, peak fault levels normally are assessed across margins covering voltage ranges and other network uncertainties. How are such margins constructed and applied off-peak to ensure suitability, conservative assumptions? I think at the moment we're, um, as I said, we're just at the uh, sort of start-up of the, uh, the project, so this, this sort of question is going to be answered um, as we sort of progress further down the line. We're working uh, sort of closely with Snyder, that are carrying out um, Here's some of the fault level work on there on the network management system will be carrying out fault level low flows, etc. I think I would just jump in and just add my piece onto that in terms of we know our design tools uh, do leave a, a, a calculation margin to what they consider the worst case and what our equipment ratings are. What the flat tool will provide is that real-time measurement that will actually allow us to understand far greater how fault level actually does change during the day. 
and what maximum it actually does reach for the different network connections that are normally uh, in use. And we'll all try and verify what's going on on the network using the Altrum fault monitor, which will look at disturbances on the network and from a rate of change of voltage and current, try and determine a fault level in, real, in pseudo real time. And the next question then for protection innovation. Do you need specific relays or do you just adjust existing relays? Well, you could do either. It's a very good question. Um, at the moment, our thinking is that we may put in a specific additional relay, certainly at the uh, primary sites, the 1166 sites, uh, and then that way that sort of makes a standard solution. Um, we could go down the road of adjusting relays or rewiring certain types of relays. That would be quite difficult with electromechanical systems and effectively you're almost creating a new system. Slightly easier with modern numeric relays with blocking inputs, etc. But at the moment, we're probably going to go down the route of putting an additional relay in. Part of our site selection process is to identify sites with a range of different relay types so that we can prove as part of the project that the adaptive protection we can get to work on the majority of sites operated by ANW or indeed across Great Britain. Okay. Can you please, please talk briefly about the technology you'll be used in the commercial solution? So the technology that, that we're currently anticipating, um, we're obviously going to be using our flat tool, which is in our core network management system, to identify when the technology on site needs to be enabled or when it will be disabled. We expect at the moment that we'll probably need some communications equipment to be installed within the customer's premise uh, that will allow that signal to be passed through so that there's something on site that can be enabled or disabled. Um, what technology will be used on site very much is a, a learning experience from ourselves because we need to try and understand what is already there and we expect every customer will be unique in their own way. Certainly as part of the trial for combined heat and power units, um, one thing we're going to try and exploit is looking at existing protection on those units and whether a trip signal can be inserted into the existing protection for that unit on site. Um, if there's no existing protection, then perhaps we'll need to do some additional installation work. As I say, until we identify customers that are willing to join the journey with us and understand what we can do, uh, until we get to site and see what's there, it's very difficult to say what technology we need to install. The ideal easy solution would be where they've got a modern numeric relay and we can apply a second setting group which we would uh, enable via an input onto the back of that relay, possibly by some sort of 3G system. Um, probably for safety reasons we will be looking for adaptive protection to be the fail safe mode, i.e. if there's no signal from the system it stays in adaptive protection mode um, and it needs the signal from the system to stay off adaptive protection mode to make sure this is a, a fail safe solution. The next question is, what is the maximum operating voltage of IF, the fuse current limiter? We're really looking at an 11 kV solution for, uh, for the RESPOND project. Um, I'd have to refer back to ABB to find out exactly what the maximum voltage would be, but I would suggest it's somewhere in the sort of 20 kilovolt range. Yeah, again, the, the details we're aware of is, is what we're using in this site, which will be to distribute two primary substation sites. Um, we would, again, refer back to ABB whether they provide IS limiters for higher, volt, higher network voltages. Which of the three methods do you expect to be fast enough to migrate fault make constraints? Well, the, this project, we're dealing with fault break constraints and make isn't part of the project. Fault currents of non-synchronous generation are normally non-constant across the period of any fault and the infeed will depend on background system strength. Where it is and how it sees the voltage depression arising from the fault, does the ENW have models for this? ENW does have models for, I think you're talking about induction generators, that kind of thing, or induction motors themselves. Um, we do have models for it. Uh, part of the project really in a way is to see 
uh, whether or not there is a contribution, a great contribution from these devices in practice, which is why we're putting in the Altrum monitor to verify the flat tool and our existing models. Do you have any ideas on how, to, how accurate the uh, flat tool will be? Are there particular conditions which will be more or less accurately modelled? Uh, at the moment, obviously, we don't really know how accurate the flat tool will be. I mean, that's part of the project. We're going to verify it against an existing system of uh, IPSA, uh, which is a, a well-used industry tool for, for looking at fault level and other issues. Um, we've not, we're not aware with this particular tool that there are any specific conditions in which it will be more or less accurate. A big part of the project really is to see whether or not this is something that uh, we and other DNOs in the UK could use as an accurate system. So as part of the setup of the project, the output of the flat tool will be prepared, as, as Steve said, against the Dennis Ipsa model and uh, the Outram tool as a real, free, real measurement. What we'll also do during the length of the project for every fault, we'll do a reverse network study. So we'll have some hard evidence to try and, again, through the life of the project, to compare the two outputs. Um, Potentially, we feel both solutions will have their inaccuracies, and part of the challenge of the project will be understanding why the output from all our sources are different. But that will be valuable learning from the project. It's very likely that, as with all these type of tools, uh, what they depend on more than anything is not so much the underlying theory, it's the data that goes in there in terms of the network model itself. That will be quite a big part of this project. Okay, well, I think if that's all questions, it's probably an appropriate time to, to wrap up this webinar. Again, if you are interested in joining, joining us for the Fault Current Limiting Service, please uh, register through our website uh, or through our email address. Um, as I said at the start of the presentation, uh, very willing to take any questions and answers afterwards if you think of anything else. And also, could you please complete our online poll and survey at the end of the webinar? Uh, it's the first time we've, it's not the first webinar that Electricity Northwest have presented, uh, but each time we try and improve and we try and use new and different technologies. So any comments you have about the presentation or about the technology that we've used to host the presentation, gratefully received. Thanks.